Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Erez Barucha. I am Director of Bharti Vidya Peet Institute of Environment, Education and Research in Pune. This module is part one of Nature and Cultures in India and it is a part of the Environment and Society program. The learning objectives of this uh, module are to understand what is culture, how is culture linked to our environment? How have various historical influences created cultural landscapes out of natural landscapes? What are the regional differences in cultural landscapes of India? And in summary, what is cultural ecology and how is this linked to climate change? Is there a link? Part one of this module is focused on evolution of culture and its regional specificity and the linkages between nature, which has spawned India's culture, her cultural diversity, which has altered nature. As nature changes, cultures adapt to change, and in turn, they continually alter nature. Human activities create impacts on nature, which are very often unsustainable, or they may be neutral, sustainable. Or, in fact, they can also be pro-conservation actions through prudent human behavior. India's 10 biogeographic natural zones have been used by mankind in multiple ways. And this is how different cultures have altered forests, grasslands, wetlands, mountains, rivers into cultural landscapes for doing agriculture, for grazing their cattle, grazing their sheep, for livestock rearing, for creating fuel wood and more recently for crea creating timber plantations. In the most recent times, traditional cultural landscapes have been converted into rural or urban landscapes, industrial areas, mining areas, ports and several other newer landscape elements. In prehistory, natural landscapes were extremely wide and the human activity were in very, very small patches. They were very small fragments in this natural landscape of forest or grassland or wetlands. In the early historical period, these natural landscapes began to shrink and the cultural landscapes began to increase. In later historical times, cultural landscapes grew into the matrix, leaving only fragments of natural landscapes behind. And in the current context, you have large areas of agriculture, growing areas of urbanization and industry, and small fragments of natural elements. So what constitutes culture? Culture is about how human societies live in their own environments. And culture deals with a vast variety of things. It's about the language we use, our social behavior, the resource patterns that we have, the food habits that we use, the religious belief and uh, the music, art and folklore, which we usually associate with what culture means. So it has a lot to do with the types of traditions that we have had, which constitute really culture. If we look at the diversity of culture in India, this is enormous. India's cultural patterns are based on our biogeographic regions in which people live and work. They are based also on historical events. They are based on what happened sometimes thousands of years ago and how that changed landscapes, land use and so on. And India has had great empires that were built. They grew, they expanded and they disintegrated. They, India has also seen a large range of invaders who came and they left triggers on our, and they triggered off different types of changes in our landscape, cha landscape elements. And so we have a wide regional diversity. This has geographical uh, linkages, it has topographical linkages, it has a wide variety of ecological differences. And this then makes different traditional cultural patterns. It's sometimes very difficult to understand how to categorize these. But a very simple way to do that would be to say we have mountain people, we have plains people, we have coastal people. And this is one way of looking at this. 
but you can break this down into how people live in various ecological setups across the country. But let's look at another angle. It's also based on the type of livelihoods that people use across our country. And those livelihoods are linked to the most ancient, which are for, who are foragers. The foragers, of course, have been limited now to mainly our tribal cultures. We have agriculturalists, pastoralists, or a combination of them of agro-pastoralists. We have fisher folk. We have a whole vast variety of art artisans in this country. So we can look at this as mountain people, plains people, coastal people, but we can also look at this as foragers, agriculturalists, fisher folk, and so on. Now, having said that, it's, uh, let's look at the mountain regions and their communities first. This is in the Trans-Himalayan and the Himalayan belt. It's also in the Western Ghats. It's also in little patches of the Nilgiris and so on. So the hill and mountain people form a very special group of communities. They are primarily pastoralists who migrate up and down. For example, in the Trans-Himalayas, you have the Changpa who move up and down in the Himalayan ranges. We have terrace farmers and livestock herders who are found across the Himalayas from the west to the east. They are found in Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, upper slopes of the mountains. In the lower slopes in Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Sikkim, Assam, the lower slopes of Arunachal in the valleys, we have Bakarwals and Bhutias who are pastoral people. And in the eastern Himalayas, in the northeast states, we have this wide variety of tribal communities, the Adi, the Abor, Apatani, wonderful people, uh, Nishis, Mishmi, Naga, and Garo. And these tribal groups were primarily foragers, but they also practiced traditional agricultural techniques, which we frequently refer to as jhum or shifting cultivation. The Western Ghats is another mountain belt which is uh, highly biodiverse, very rich in forest, very rich in flora and fauna. And here, the local people have always been expert foragers. They are also agro-pastoralists, they grow paddy, but they are primarily NTFP collectors. And these people are, have a deep understanding of what there is in the nature around them. Even for their agriculture, they use a very complex tradition of rab cultivation, which means that they lop tree branches, they pile up the, the dead branches, and they will burn these in about a third or a fifth of their field, along with some cattle dung. And this becomes the nursery for the traditional varieties of rice and other crops which they refer to as nachdi, and worry. This, these crops are now very rapidly disappearing. The paddy cultivation also occurs because they are able to very beautifully terrace these lower slopes right down to the riverfront. And therefore, these people are enormously able to manage water sources. The other part of this uh, area where communities live are the freshwater fishing people. And some of these, like the Madhav Kuri, have been able to create the most incredible fish traps. They know exactly how to manage the river courses and nala courses for catching their fish. There are a lot of unique features of the Western Ghats. One of them is the sacred groves that they have. These sacred groves are patches of forest which uh, would be evergreen or semi-evergreen. They are necessarily small. They have a small animistic shrine somewhere, which gradually became a small temple. But today you find that the local people, the local panchayat, has started building roads to go there so that people can come and do puja in a big temple. This is what is gradually destroying these groves. So, these culturally distinct communities like the Madhokori, the Katkari, who are 
really tribal people who uh, have all sorts of trapping mechanisms for animals are from this whole belt of Maharashtra, Goa, Karnataka. As you go south, you have the Kani tribals, and they also are hunter-gatherers. And finally, we have this very interesting community in the Nilgiris called the Todas, who are buffalo herders. And uh, these people are now restricted to a very small number of people living there with their traditional type of pastoralism. The other interesting group of people who are hill people live in the central highlands of India, in the Vindhya and the Satpura ranges. These people are the ancient tribal people of our country and they originated probably somewhere in the time when uh, the cave people lived in Bibetka. They are hunter-gatherers in the early period but very soon became agriculturalists and pastoralists. And this you can see in the caves of Bibetka near, uh, the, in this whole belt across the central highlands. The cultural tribal communities here are NTFP foragers and agro-pastoral people. And culturally, they are distinct tribal communities, the Kokna, the Bhil, the Gond, the Baigas, the Maryas, who live across this belt. And in many cases, there will be villages in which you can get three or four different tribal communities living in the same village. The Eastern Ghats is a very interesting patch of forested hills. Again here we have foragers and paddy farmers and they are culturally distinct communities like Marias, Mariagons, Juang, Santal and this is a very fascinating area because many of them are ancient forager communities who are basically were always dependent on hunting and this is a big problem because these hunter-gatherers had no land and because they have no land today they are they are really at a very, very poor uh, economic status. One finds that if they have no land, the, they can't go into the forest to collect resources. They cannot go into a protected area or national park or sanctuary. And when they have no ability to go and hunt, they actually have no food to eat. The other part of this whole thinking that these local people have is their sacred groves which they even today they plant new sacred groves so that they can actually venerate their own deity in a sal forest there are several indigenous varieties of rice these people grow in any village if you go today in, in, in any village market you may see seven to ten or twelve varieties of rice and uh, this is wonderful because for each of them, they will tell you this has a specific aroma, this has a specific taste, this has a specific health issue. And uh, they are able to do this. There are cultural conditions there which we still don't know how to clearly handle. For example, some communities practice what is known as Akhan Shikar. And they do this on several times during the year. And a large number of people will go with huge number of nets and bows and arrows and really massacre a lot of wildlife. We need to understand what is the alternative that we can offer them so that this kind of practice, which is extremely damaging to wildlife, can be curtailed. If you look at these mountain people, they are from the highlands of Orissa, Jharkhand, Bihar, West, West Bengal. And these are all our very rich forest tracks. But these are also the lands on which we can get coal and iron. And this makes this big problem of how do we do uh, manage an area so that we get what we need for industry, but they get the lifestyle that they require in the local area. Let's look a little bit at the plains people of India. This is from ancient times our early city-states in the Indus and Saraswati uh, Valley civilizations. They were primarily farmers, but they were also cattle herders. In North India, we have this huge Aryan uh, influence. They came as cattle herders and turned into settled farmers. In South India, we have this huge Dravidian cultures, again paddy farmers, and they found 
that irrigation was the way to increase from the limited resources that they had of land into more and more agricultural belts. But they also did very fantastic things. These ancient people built cave, cave monasteries. They had incredible temple architecture across India in different styles. And very interestingly, we were able to get Western influences that came in over a period of time into our own cultural and architectural characteristics. Most people will believe that uh, the concept of India is something the British left us. I frankly believe this is not so. Uh, if you think of India and Indian empires, then it starts way back with Mauryas and Guptas, who actually had enormous large empires which stretched way into the west. So we had these enormous empires that were indigenous to our country. We also have the whole differences in art between what we can consider as tribal and non-tribal cultures. And this is something that we need to actually uh, look at in much greater detail. We also had religious influences coming wave after wave. Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, the Muslim cultures have changed India in many, many ways and changed culture in many, many ways into this huge diversity of culture that we have. If we look at plains people also, we have to think of the desert people that we have in Rajasthan and Gujarat. These are primarily based on pastoralism, cattle herders, buffalo herders, shepherds and also camel herders. The camel herders are very interesting because they transported large amount of goods and that they took from India into the West and brought back from the Middle East. The dryland agriculturists of this area, the Bajra growers, the Jawar growers, they also had wheat and cotton. These are people who now depend increasingly on irrigation systems and the whole landscape is therefore being changed. Uh, this is a bit scary because as climate change comes, we may find that the current type of agriculture we have will not suit new climatic conditions. The semi-arid grassland dependent communities like the Maldaris, for example, have beautiful breeds of cattle. And uh, today the Maldari has spread from the desert out into many wider areas with uh, large herds of cattle. The Deccan Plateau people are primarily Bajra and Jawar farmers. And uh, they have a dual cropping system, which also means that if one crop fails in the year, the other crop actually supports them. These are people who have traditionally made percolation tanks. And these percolation tanks are also connected to a system of irrigation systems. So these complex water management systems is something that is not new to India. It's something that is very, very old. They also have cattle husbandry. But I think what is we need to understand about the Deccan Plateau people is how the, the pastoralists, the migrant pastoralists who are known as the Dhangars in Maharashtra, move from the Deccan Plateau, the central arid part of the Deccan Plateau, across the Western Ghats into the coasts of India, uh, in the uh, coasts of Maharashtra. And here we find that uh, some very interesting interlinkages occur between communities. When the Dhangar migrates with his sheep, he parks the sheep in a farm of a local pastor, uh, of a local agriculturist. And therefore, he keeps those sheep there and actually the farmer pays him to do that because the sheep dung is then becomes very good fertilizer. So this relationship is sometimes very, very old. And you have communities or small groups of dhangars who are linked to specific villages of agricultural people. Another interesting group of, of uh, people are the nomads. You have a very, very different nomadic tribes across all of India. The Pardi, for example, are hunting people, but they also are fantastic 
at collecting natural resources. They are dependent on NTFP. We have Vaidus who depend on, are dependent on a large variety of medicinal products. We have the Nandiwala who has a super bull which actually foretells, foretells your future. And you have Lamans and people who uh, used to carry large amount of goods across India. Now, all these people, for them again the problem is that they are landless. And when they are landless, they have problems with landed people wherever they move. The Gangetic Plains people, the food bowl of India. In the west, it is uh, primarily wheat, in the east, it is primarily rice. These are highly dependent again on cattle as fertilizer and for fuel. There are several of these kingdoms which were centered around Delhi hundreds of years ago. And they became the plains people of India. They had Rajput states and they had states which, when the Muslims came in, took over these states and made large empires. Currently, they are the largest producers of wheat and other cultivars for our country. Altered land use is really a key to understanding cultural ecology of our country. And one of the problems that we need to understand and look at is when climate change happens, we'll have serious implications on how land is used and how land cover changes. Uh, the non-timber forest resources that people can uh, collect are forage from around their villages. And these non-timber forest products are used as consumer items for their own selves or they are used as productive items. And so we have food products like roots and fruit and a whole lot of medicinal plants that are collected from these forests and are sold in the local market from which they sometimes reach even pharmaceutical products. So this is what NTFP is used for in different biogeographic regions of India. Bimitka is a hill region close to Bhopal, which is probably occupied by human beings for the last 10,000 years. And uh, these are small caves on which they have depicted their own lifestyles during the, during the Neolithic period. This is very fascinating because we find that uh, we are able to say how these people actually lived. Uh, the Mauryan Empire, which uh, was a very important uh, golden age for our country, was in 265 BC. And this spread, as you can see in this map, all the way across most of India and into Afghanistan and Persia. So we had this huge indigenous empire which spread across half the then known world. The Gupta Empire between 280 to 550 AD spread again across a large part of the then known cultural world which uh, was again an area which had enormous culture of its own. This uh, species of deer that you see here is the central highland Barasinga which is found only in this belt and nowhere else. It is a unique species found in Kana, uh, which had nearly disappeared. And with good management, this has now grown into a larger population. These are the Bishnoi people. They have got traditions which, through which they have culturally looked after their Khejri trees and all the black buck and chikara which come around their villages. They don't even mind if some of their crop is damaged and they will look after these with great enthusiasm. This is the black buck of the semi-arid plains of India, the Deccan Plateau, the semi-arid regions of Rajasthan, which once occurred in huge herds as you see here. They gradually shrink, shrank into smaller and smaller populations and today with good protection where they have got drought prone area development programs, these populations of black buck have again started gradually growing. This is the rare black neck crane which you find in Ladakh. There are very few birds now and they occur in the wetlands 
which are very specific to their habitat. This is, uh, these large fishing trawlers are now damaging our fish resources extensively. And we have to find ways of sustainably managing our fish resources. The lowest hill slopes of the Himalayas have been traditionally used by local people through this kind of uh, terracing. And uh, the way in which this is done is highly complex because it also requires a very good water distribution system. Traditional fisher folk have had various ways of catching fish. And uh, today the trawlers which we see can catch very, very large numbers of very large fish from even deeper waters. Uh, Toda people who are basically buffalo herders also have various other very interesting traditions. They are experts at uh, uh, embroidery and making artic articles out of local produce. The dryland crops which occur in most of our semi-arid areas consists of bajra and jawar. This is a bajra plot in the Deccan Plateau. Our traditional magicians can follow up their family tree up to seven generations. Uh, this is a toda which is typical shawl and is, very, is two very favorite buffaloes. Uh, the run of kutch is the single home now for the wild ass in the, uh, in the desert part of uh, India.